Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Jumpstarting Your Cyber Defense Machine with the CIS Controls Version 7. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Event Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be a part of this webcast. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check the vo speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's presentation will be using a, sli a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the right top corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you are not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you're experiencing any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It is the question mark icon on your console and covers common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We will have a Q&A session during the last part of the presentation. Also, feel free to submit any comments you have via this widget. Lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand webcast. So now, let's get on with the presentation. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Maurice Uenuma, to start us off with our presenter introduction. Take it away, Maurice. Great. Thank you, Kate. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this webinar and to introduce our uh, featured speaker. Uh, Tony Sager is Senior Vice President and Chief Evangelist at the Center for Internet Security. Uh, there he leads the effort uh, that is a global uh, effort to maintain, sustain, and promulgate the CIS controls. Uh, he is also a Director of the SANS uh, Innovation Center. Tony's perspectives that he will share uh, regarding the CIS controls are based on uh, both his current work at CIS, as well as uh, his background in this, the, uh, the controls before they were called CIS controls, uh, as it turns out. He was there in the early days as it began uh, as it began as a consensus list of best practices for uh, those in the cyber defense business. Tony's background includes over three decades in information assurance, information security, uh, cyber defense, and whatever it's been called in between during those years at the National Security Agency and uh, was entrusted to lead uh, and manage some of the protection efforts for our most sensitive information, information uh, systems and, uh, and control systems. And so today, Tony will, uh, as you saw on the registration page, discuss some of the key attributes of the CIS controls, uh, how it fits into uh, and is a key foundational element of any successful cyber defense program. Uh, and in particular, the timing for this discussion is based on the recent release of version 7 of the CIS controls, and he will provide some background and context on that and uh, discuss also implementing and operationalizing uh, the CIS controls. And so Tony will present uh, for a bit, and then we'll have an open discussion, and we look forward to your participation as an audience uh, with your questions and answers as well. Uh, so we uh, hope and trust that this will be interesting, informative, and perhaps uh, even enjoyable. So, Tony, uh, welcome to the program, and uh, I now turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Maurice, and thank you, Kate. It's a pleasure, and thanks, everyone, for dialing in today. I know everyone's uh, busy, working hard, recovering from the holiday weekend. So, uh, as Maurice said, I'm going to walk through a little bit of background on the CIS controls, just enough for those that don't have uh, that much familiarity. Talk about some of the motivations, I think, uh, some of the things we were trying to achieve with version 7 and where I think uh, all this is going and what it means to you. So, you know, um, Mo was very polite. I have a lot of time in this business, um, hitting uh, 42 years here in a month or so. And um, most of that at the National Security Agency, 35 years, all of it in defense, and all of it really in the business of uh, understanding, finding, making sense of vulnerability. So vulnerability is to be found everywhere, as we now know, in technology, in processes, in uh, the way people operate and make use of technology. And so trying to get a handle on there, that is very complex. But let me just give you in one slide kind of my life lessons uh, after four decades of this kind of stuff. And I'll go through them very briefly here. You know, knowing about problems doesn't get them fixed. Um, you know, I spent my, most of my time 
either as one of the vulnerability finders for the defense or managing the organizations that do that. And I think I got to see that, uh, at least for my day, at as big a scale as uh, anyone, uh, certainly in the U.S. government and maybe anywhere. Uh, red teams, blue teams, uh, zero-day finders, you know, everything from technology to content processes. Uh, the, the unique part of uh, my career was really a chance to see all this at scale, both uh, how it happens in technology and what we see in the lab, but also in the Defense Department across the larger U.S. government uh, with lots of friends in industry. And uh, I can say with a straight face, I'm one of the few lifelong defenders who lived his life inside an intelligence agency. So I have a pretty good education in what uh, happens around the world and, and how this works at the nation state to nation state level. And that, that was a real uh, awakening for me somewhere in the middle of my career that, you know, hey, we told them the problem. The red team pointed out this problem. You know, there was this flaw. And, boy, we saw the same problem when we came back three months later and six months later. And, you know, it's easy to sort of blame the victim here and say, well, you know, that we told them what to do and why didn't they fix it? Well, it turns out that the root causes are actually much more complicated. And it's not a matter of defenders being lazy or they don't care. It's that this is legitimately a really complicated, messy operational problem. And it's not just about buying the right thing, but it's also about uh, the way we organize ourselves, a complicated world that is in, in constant flux. So the, the use of technology, the business demands for it, the role of people, uh, you know, what's in the marketplace, all these things uh, come together to make problems really, really hard to fix. And so it, you don't want to go for the sort of easy idea that says, you know, here's a problem. Somebody just needs to take our report or our PowerPoint or our Word document and do something about it. That has never worked in my experience. It's always about understanding root cause, standing back from, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of data points and trying to see what is really going on here. Uh, the other, the flip side of the defensive equation is about the bad guy. And it's a little easy in this business, I think, to, to treat bad guys as magic. And it sure feels like it. You know, every day there's a new zero day, a new demonstration of a flaw. And you know, they, they seem to be so successful, and they are in many dimensions. But if you think of them as doing magic, your only defense is your own magic, and that just doesn't work either. So, you know, a bad guy has a boss, has a budget. They like to do things at work. They have their own risk model in their heads, right? They don't like to get caught. They don't like to get exposed. Uh, they want to come back. And so you, you really need to think of this in terms of their life cycle, the way they're thinking of attacking your life cycle. And so your, your goal is never perfection in defense. It's about understanding the bad guy well enough to make good defensive choices at the right time and the right place, preferably in a place that's advantageous to you. And we'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, the, the third point up here is that defense is always a prioritization game. You have no choice. None of us has enough money or people or time or the luxury of sort of a static environment where we can really look at this analytically and leisurely. You're always prioritizing. The only question is, how do you prioritize? And do you have enough information to make rational choices? And if you don't, then how can you get more? Or how can you get others to help you with those, those choices? The prioritization is just inherent in the business. And given the nature of this, right, you, you have to operate whatever your business or government agency is doing. You don't get the luxury of sitting on the sideline for a year while you design things and put things in place. You have to survive today. So you've got to pick things early that give you lots of value and that lay a foundation for the next steps. And that's built into the way we have thought about this problem at CIS. The uh, next big point is about the kind of fundamental nature of cyber defense. Again, we, we tend to think of it in terms like, well, we just had the right technology. That was the world I grew up in in the 70s and 80s, right? The government will invent the right technology using your taxpayer dollars and will have you know, formally verified, kernelized, mathematically provable operating systems, et cetera, et cetera. And that dream, uh, driven by some of the most brilliant minds I've ever met, has never really come to fruition in the live marketplace. It's not about technology, and it's not about training our way to greatness either. It's not, um, uh, it's not a popular line, but, you know, we're never going to train our way to success here. Training is essential. That awareness of phishing and those kinds of procedural things are important, but they are just a part of a much more complex problem. Really, at its heart, and this is a conclusion I reached somewhere in the middle of my career, is that the nature of defense, defense is primarily an information management problem. That is the gathering of information, the translation of it into action, the movement of that information to where it's needed, and having designed an architecture to take advantage and do something with the information. Right? 
you know, the market will say, well, we need more threat intelligence, and we do. We need better understanding, you know, and we need better technology, sure, and we need to train people, of course. But this is all about the flow of information. And the quicker you come to that realization, the better you are to uh, develop solid strategies. So, um, you know, the mantra in, in the press and in uh, the Beltway for some years has been about sharing, right? If we just could share, you know, threat sharing and let's set up mechanisms for that, those are all great. But at the end of the day, we're not trying to build a nation of threat sharers. We're trying to run businesses, run government services, not run institutions. So my, my plea is whenever you see that verb share, remind yourself to mentally replace it with uh, different verbs like translate and execute. Right? We're not sharing for sharing's sake. Those are a means to an end. We're trying to do something with that information so we can run our business, so we can execute the mission of our agency. And you know, so you can share more, you can get more information, but if you haven't designed the infrastructure that will take advantage of it, that can do something with it, then you're just flooding your inbox with more stuff. We'll talk about that momentarily. And then finally, uh, to the sort of life lessons for me, and the, the term I've been using is that cyber defense is more, if you like popular movies, and I do, uh, cyber defense is more like Groundhog Day than Independence Day. So you remember the movie Independence Day, Will Smith, you know, the aliens, and remember the sort of basic premise, right? The alien mothership is coming. Uh, we can see them. They're out there. We can take their technology. Brilliant people can reverse engineer it. Heroes can deliver it. We deliver the virus to the aliens. Boom goes the alien mothership. The heroes come back to a parade and a celebratory cigar. And uh, I don't know about you, but you know, I've been 40 years as a cyber defender. Not many parades for us in cyber defense. Where it's much more like the movie, uh, if you remember, with Bill Murray, Groundhog Day. Every day feels like the same day, right? Over and over, we're looking at uh, you know, the uh, repeat of millions of things over and over again. And that's the nature of attacks, too, right? We're not getting hit by wildly unique, sophisticated new attacks every day. We're getting hit by millions of repeats of the same old garbage every day. And it feels like Groundhog Day over and over. And the hope is that we get a little bit smarter, make small changes, uh, look at the effect that it has, and keep improving over time. And that's really closer to the nature of defense than this Independence Day. They're, they're the bad guys. We know where they are. One invention, one delivery, one heroic act. I'm not sure I see that coming in the next few years, at least not during the rest of my career. So, so these are my life lessons in cybersecurity. And uh, let, let me talk to you a little bit about how we've tried to translate those into action and what it really means when I talk about a cyber defense machine. So for those of you that uh, have a military background, and if you don't, don't worry about it. This is a very conceptually simple idea. The notion of an OODA loop is common in military circles. And OODA is an acronym, uh, Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. And it's, it's what I just described to you about machinery. That is, this is a, uh, an information model and a conceptual model. It came out of aerial dogfighting some, sometime back in history. And the notion is a sound one, which is, uh, when, when you're engaged, for example, in aerial uh, dogfighting or combat, your ability to uh, bring in information, make sense of it, put it into context, make a decision, and take action, your ability to execute that loop, right, from gathering of information through execution, and then get, and get feedback and continue and do it again, your ability to execute that loop over and over again rapidly has a tremendous influence on your success or failure. In particular, if you can do this faster than your opponent, you have a tremendous advantage. And that doesn't mean you win every time, but it means your ability to think this way, design yourself this way, and execute this has a tremendous influence on your success or failure. And so that was really designed around the sort of tactics of, of uh, aerial dogfighting. But think of it as applied to this business here. And we all live in these loops every moment of every day, whether we realize it or not. And the example I show you up here is Patch Tuesday. And again, we can uh, kind of walk your way through the slide. I won't go through every word, but observe, right? We're all watching for security bulletins to arrive, these advisories. They come out either an irregular cycle or a regular cycle. We orient ourselves. We make sense of them. We decide, does this apply to me? How many of these do I have out there? Are they in a vulnerable configuration? What is the risk I face? What are the operational issues? Do I really know what's going on in my environment? Can I make an honest risk decision here? I make a decision as to what should I do. Shall I patch? Shall I wait? Shall I uh, do more testing? And I prioritize the way I'm going to approach remediation here. And then I eventually take action. I'm going to roll things out. I'm going to 
monitor what's going to happen, and I'm going to manage the inevitable breakage, right, because there's, there's going to be some unknowns that are, that are going to uh, pop up at the moment I do this. And I'm going to do it all over again and over again and over again. And this is a kind of a, a loop that we live every month whether we realize it or not. Well, you know who else is living in this exact same loop, right? It's the bad guy. He's waiting for these security bulletins and advisories. He's orienting himself by, hmm, let me reverse engineer this. If it's important enough to put out a patch, there must be something interesting in here. Is there a vulnerability that I can take advantage of? How can I operationalize it, weaponize it, deploy it? Let me decide, do I have victims that would have this technology in a vulnerable state? If so, let me deploy you know, this weaponized version of this patch and then uh, implant myself in there before the, the good guys can fix uh, the problem here. And history tells us that bad guys can execute this loop faster than you can as defenders. It's not because they're better or smarter. It's because they don't worry about things like system breakage and cranky users and the complexities, right? And they can be very targeted as opposed to worrying about the entire enterprise. But you can, we can all improve dramatically in the way that we manage these loops. And you know, there's, depending on the enterprise, this, this patch cycle can be hours to days to months to never, depending on the complexity and scale of the defensive enterprise. So we can never win this one 100% of the time. We can get a lot better. But the real goal here is not to win this one, because we really actually live in what I, a world of what I call dueling oozes. There are many of these information loops running all the time. And they're often connected, right? The ability to uh, sense, for example, the state of my enterprise. How many machines do I have? What's, what's online? What state of configuration are they in? You know, who, who are the people that are authorized to make changes in them? That's all part of your patch cycle also, right? So it's a connected loop in there. And the goal of defense, again, is not perfection. Many times these loops are about can I, uh, the term I used to use is farther in space earlier in time. I'd like to detect things that I should care about farther out in space and before they get to me, i.e. earlier in time. And we get a lot of that uh, really inherently from the marketplace, right? When you deal with a, a vendor, say a tripwire or any of the big anti-malware or security vendors, uh, think of it as they are doing this farther in space earlier in time on your behalf. You don't have sensors around the world typically, but they do. And their ability to gather new information, and you hope, by the way, that you are not victim zero, but they are able to gather information across a really broad front, make sense of it, reverse engineer it, improve their heuristics, improve signatures, right, make changes, and deal with this long before it enters your enterprise. And that's the goal here. Uh, but you also have to think, um, you know, it may seem hopeless, right? I mentioned that the bad guy can always run that sort of patch Tuesday cycle faster than you. But, you know, the bad guy, again, has a boss, has a budget. You know, their loop is also an opportunity. So that when they are deploying things, they are counting on their own reconnaissance, their own knowledge of your system, their ability to weaponize, their ability to build stealth into it, the ability to build a complicated command and control, maybe an exfiltration of data, uh, a cycle exiting data from your enterprise. So all of those loops are an opportunity for defense also. And so again, you don't have to get to perfection, but you do have to understand the bad guy enough to interrupt them, raise their visibility, raise their cost, et cetera. And that, so all these loops are really what I would call the machinery of, um, of information security and cybersecurity. And they really are a helpful way, I believe, to think about this problem and to sort of strategically de design your defenses in contrast to let's buy the next shiny box or fancy integrator or brand new algorithms. You know, we need all those things. Please don't, don't think, I, I don't think, understand the importance. However, we have to think of this as a machine in total that we are designing. So great insight into new attack or trade crafts, for example, doesn't do me any good unless I can detect it in my enterprise, unless I can reach out across my own enterprise to understand where it's relevant, what is the risk, can I make a change, can I block the right thing, can I detect the presence of the file that is ind indicative of the uh, malware, et cetera. So if I were standing back to look at this notion of a cyber defense machine, these are kind of the general properties that I would look for. Central to this is this notion of powered by information, right? Designing the machine to think of information in this way. How am I going to collect it? How am I going to move it? How am I going to translate it? How am I going to take action upon it? And this was a struggle even in government to see this and to get people to understand this, this loop. Again, I mentioned I, I spent my career, government career, uh, inside the intelligence agency. And so that view, you know, some amazing human beings 
but they are very information centric in the if I know what the bad guy is doing sense, I'll be smarter and I can defend myself. And they're very focused on that outward looking problem. Most of them have no background or interest or really understanding of the inside the enterprise defend myself. So the notion was, well, if I, if I just understood the bad guys better and when they're coming and how to spot them, I'm good to go, right? And I said, well, how will, what will you do with that information if you find it? And I get this quizzical look, and, would, and the answer would be, well, I'll send it to everybody that needs to know. Oh, so you're going to send an email to every system administrator in the Defense Department? You know, their inbox is already flooded, right? That doesn't help them. And they said, well, that's actionable. I said, no, that, that's not actionable. It's readable. Right? Readable is not the same as something you can immediately act upon, preferably by technology. So think of it again as we're designing this information-centered machine. Uh, whatever your machinery is, it's really based on this notion of a model of attacks, of attackers and prioritization. So again, we, we can't treat the bad guys magic. We have to think of them as professional, because they are, uh, determined, often better funded than you are, and the goal is to understand them well enough to make good defensive choices. And to, to get that understanding, to build those kind of models, you need to look outside your world at these masses and masses of attacks and try to pull out root cause and commonality and patterns and templates. And, you know, we're not going to chase millions and millions of attacks, and we don't actually need to. What we need to understand are the general patterns, the general types of things that we need to look for. And you know, the notion here is translation, right? That verb is really important. Translating millions and millions of data points about bad things into a relatively small number of positive, constructive things that you can actually do about it. At the end of the day, all of this needs to be driven by um, standards-based, by open what I would call plumbing. And I've been using that term for at least 10, 15 years now. Uh, I was involved in all the early standards that you may be familiar with around that, that apply to security automation, like uh, CVE and Oval and so forth. And I won't go through all those. But think of them as an attempt to standardize plumbing. That is, if we're going to move things, if this is about information and its movement, then how do I make that as low-cost, friction-free, universal as possible. And the metaphor I came up with many years ago was plumbing. Uh, you know, standardized plumbing gives us civilization, right? And so I, we can have indoor fixtures, and I can go to Home Depot or wherever and buy things and not worry about how they connect into my system. They just do because everyone recognizes this uh, indoor plumbing, unless you have a really old house like my son, in which case we're always finding new, new quirks. But the notion, I think, is sound. That is, we as buyers of technology and security products and services need to insist upon this notion of openness and standards. Right? We always want to be looking for the best of. We always want to be uh, upgrading technology and bringing new things into our in a defensive environment. And we want to absolutely minimize the transition costs, the friction, the interfaces. We cannot allow ourselves to be locked into things that really cannot be undone that are uh, vendor unique. But this also... Um, it leads me to the notion of what I call community risk. Uh, this is an observation after decades inside the government, you know, seeing really large, well-funded government agencies and some of the biggest companies uh, in the economy. And none of them can deal with this problem at a 100% level. And in fact, again, they don't really have to. We all face a, some, some level of threat and risk just by virtue of being in, as part of the Internet. Right? I call this community risk. Uh, that is, we all have to worry about a set of things whether we realize it, know it or not, whether we do a study to tell us that we need to or not. Think of it as kind of like public health, right? We have to worry about a lot of things, even if I don't know it's directly outside my doorstep. So from getting vaccinations to washing my hands to not coughing on people, right, to avoiding um, um, unclean locations, to insisting upon requirements for food handling, we do all these things based on a notion of community risk independent of whether someone's looked at that particular doorknob and made a decision that I need to clean that one off, we just do it, right? Because it's uh, an accessible action. It's not extraordinary technology. It makes sense for us to do it. And the science behind it is where we have the potential to interrupt the vector of transmission of disease. And so we want to think of this as I can't count on all my cyber neighbors to do the right analysis, make the right decision, understand the threat equally and then all take action equally. That will never happen. We need to think of this at a community level, and that's a really important part of how we uh, approach this across the entire community, not just enterprise by enterprise. 
But at the end of the day, of course, some of us face more risk than others, right? Some of us have more at stake. Some of us work in riskier environments. So you have to have a model that can be tailored to whatever the, the current situation is. All this is about um, in building a, machi a machine that is feedback driven, that's repeatable, that's dynamic. And we need this machinery to be what I would call a negotiable and demonstrable. That is, most of us now are spending a great deal of our time not just uh, thinking about the tax and how to defend, but proving to other parties that we have done the right thing. And by that I mean uh, you know, the, the big change for, for someone who's been in this business for 40 years, the big change in the last just small number of years has been the emergence of all these other players in cybersecurity, all these players who are not coming at it from a technology level. By that I mean auditors, lawyers, judges, insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera. This is really changing the nature of cyber in a good way. Um, in that, uh, this notion of cyber defense and the technology, the attacks, and so forth is moving from a really important and interesting technical challenge to something that becomes embedded in the way that we as a society make decisions, make choices about risk, and the way we operate businesses and we operate the missions of agencies. And that's a good thing. That is, we really need this to be something that uh, uh, takes this complicated, fast-changing cyber technology and risk world and translates it in a way that, in which we can make reasonable, rational, explainable decisions because that's the, rest, that's the way the rest of society works. We don't make specific choices about whether it's safe to uh, drive across a bridge, for example. We believe with good, you know, with good cause that that uh, bridge was designed by a certified engineer, met building codes, used appropriate materials, you know, had all the sort of things that we would expect as citizens, lay people, to be built into something that has life safety uh, implications in the construction. That does not mean that bridge is perfect. That means that within a sort of a rational decision win window and framework, it makes sense, and we as citizens can make rational decisions about our use of a, a, a piece of engineering like that. And again, so we're moving in that kind of way towards um, uh, with this whole cyber business, and that's why all these other players have to rush in to help us understand this. And so this, whatever our machinery looks like, whatever decision choices we make, really have to be demonstrable to what I would call real people, the rest of society and the enforcement mechanisms that we build up across society. So all these ideas um, are inherent in what we now call the CIS controls. I won't go through the whole history of it, but as Mo mentioned, I'm, I was there on day zero. Literally, I grabbed five friends. We sat down in a room. and early 2000s, I was struggling with the, the most common question that I got whenever I was out speaking in public. And that question was, what do I do first? And you can tell I never had the job of uh, having to solve these problems, only pointing out these problems. And I said, wow, I've never thought of it that way. What do you do first? And I would point to the NIST, you know, great stuff out of NIST, and from NSA, we were releasing the NSA security guide to the public, and all these good sources, and people would go, yeah, yeah, that's great stuff, but it's a thousand pages. It's really complicated. What do I do in the first month? What do I convince the boss to support first? What do I buy first? I thought, wow, I think, I think I need to go back and think about this. So I grabbed a few friends. It was a very modest list of, you know, if you don't know where to start, start here. And the two-page thing turned into a, a series of projects that you see on the slide there. And um, it, it got a weight of its own through the SANS Institute, the biggest feature in cybersecurity. And it was formerly known as the SANS Top 20. When I retired in June of 2012, I wound up going to SANS to do some part-time work and wound up taking the project over and with their support, spinning it out into a nonprofit status, uh, which, which is now part of the Center for Internet Security. And now we have, uh, know it by the name of the CIS controls. And so uh, that simplifies a really complicated history. But the notions have been very consistent, this idea of uh, prioritization, what do I do first? What is the foundation for defense? Take our understanding of attacks, right? Hard earned, large scale look at all these bad things that can happen, translate them into the smallest number of positive construction, constructive things that we think will really both take a big bite out of the problem and lay the foundation for more complex and more sophisticated defenses. So that's really the notion that underlies all this. Uh, we, uh, as Maurice mentioned earlier, we just released a couple of months ago CIS Control version 7, 
Uh, the list is up here. We'll, we'll give you a reference to it. I won't go through all this. But uh, those of you that are professionals in this field, which I'm going to guess is about all of you, uh, there is no rocket science here, right? And that's by design for the kinds of uh, focus and the kind of foundation that we talked about. This is not about exotic, uh, non-existent, you know, coming someday to save us technology. This is about organizing our defenses in a manner that gives us the best effect against the largest number of adversaries and lays the foundation for the next big steps. So that's what you see made out in front of you here. Uh, we'll, we'll give you a pointer towards the actual document that you can download, and there's a whole ecosystem of complementary materials and supporting things that go with it, and uh, the controls are well supported by the vendor community. I think Maurice will talk to you a little bit about that in a moment. But uh, the notion has gone from uh, a simple list to really a collection of things to help people accomplish the intent of the list. And that's really my goal, and that's why we, I really needed a company home for this. Uh, it's not about you know, publishing a better list than everybody else has. You can go to NIST and get great information. You can go to any of a dozen or more uh, great sources, and every October you can wait for Cybersecurity Month's magazine articles to come out on you know, top 10 things to do. That's great. But remember I said earlier, just knowing about flaws doesn't get them fixed. Well, knowing about a list of positive things to do doesn't actually ever happen either. And so you need to build this whole support system. Uh, most of us, my experience has been, learn best from someone else who's already done it. The problem is finding that somebody. And that's kind of the notion of CIS, and how do we pull all this together into a way, into a way that really helps people uh, with defense in a very supportive way that is naturally consistent with all the other security frameworks out there. We're not creating yet another one. We're creating really more of a priority scheme, but a way to help people achieve the intent and then, then deal with this issue of how do I prove to others I've done the right thing. And so uh, if you want, need to reach me, uh, feel free to use any of this contact information. You can go to cisecurity.org and get all of these materials. And you know, we do this as a nonprofit, so you can get all this great content developed by volunteers. And I would be astounded if there were a few of you on the uh, webcast today out in the audience. Um, is produced by an amazing collection of people from around the world. The role of CIS is just as the mechanism that brings people together around these projects and helps produce and support these ideas. So uh, feel free to reach out to me. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our hosts, and then we'll uh, continue on with uh, questions and so forth. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tony. really appreciate it. And uh, reading now, just a very brief word from your local sponsor, if you will, um, just a couple slides, and then we're going to have a more open discussion or dialogue that includes questions from all of you in the audience. Uh, Tony referred to building a support system, uh, being able to actually look at the list of good things to do is uh, enshrined in the CI control to being able to uh, effectively implement that. And so uh, just a brief word on that. And when we look at all the things that we as cyber defenders must do and organizations must accomplish, right, there are certainly best practice frameworks, uh, chief among them the CIS controls, uh, as well as numerous regulatory uh, and compliance frameworks and regimes, right, as you can see here on this slide. And so there are a number of uh, things to do. Uh, but if we look at the, uh, the CIS controls, as we think about what, uh, what it is asking us to do, uh, there are some essential things that must be done, right, to kind of uh, translate it into plain English, if you will. It's really around kind of knowing what it is that you're protecting, uh, it's about being able to define secure configurations, about being able to continuously monitor uh, vulnerabilities and be able to remediate those, uh, to limit administrative privileges and so forth. And so there are some uh, kind of very common controls uh, that are uh, that that you see uh, repeatedly as you look across these various best practice frameworks and compliance regimes. And underlying those then. And in order to effectively implement those controls, there are in turn a set of kind of organizational and technical capabilities. And the idea behind the capabilities, of course, is to be consistent with and adhere to best practices, uh, but being able to do so in uh, as much of a uh, cyber defense machine way as possible, to use Tony's uh, terminology. It cannot, it's not going to happen on its own. And we have to find a way to properly manage the information uh, so that we can uh, implement these controls. So we look at some capabilities here like asset management, configuration management, vulnerability management, uh, along with a quote here from the IT Process Institute, 
one of quite a few, by the way, from various different sources that underscore the importance of some of these essential basic controls as reflected uh, in the CIS controls and really just in uh, uh, the furthest left column, as you might recall, what we'll call basic controls. Even uh, successfully implementing those uh, can address the vast uh, portion of the incidents and breaches that we see out there, and that's reflected in uh, not only the experience of uh, cyber defense professionals, but also in the data uh, in terms of survey data and real incident breach data, uh, as uh, many of us reference uh, at this time of year after they're published. So as we look at these uh, uh, kind of important technical and organizational capabilities, just a brief word on how we at Tripwire help support that. And you know, I can speak from experience coming from CIS, actually, and formally uh, honored to be a, a colleague of uh, Tony's there. Uh, Tripwire has always focused on really these core foundational things. And from a capability standpoint, the center or the foundation of Tripwire's core capabilities, integrity monitoring, uh, as you may know, for about 20 years ago, first developed as an open source project and, uh, and eventually commercialized as we began to build out the, uh, the various capabilities around that, the ability to integrate with other platforms and so forth. But we're looking for changes. We're looking for system. We're looking very closely at system state, so system configuration monitoring and database configuration monitoring. We're comparing that against baselines, whether it's a previous uh, state or an external uh, regulatory standard or internal one. And by the way, another plug for CIS here is CIS security benchmarks, one of the most commonly used uh, hardening standards out there uh, are arguably uh, alongside the CIS controls, the most widely used and referenced work that CIS does. And so I would point you to that. Now, we, along with uh, uh, many other companies, actually helped you to, to implement that. But we're looking at, uh, in great detail, the system standards, uh, system files, looking for changes, who made the change, in what context, and so forth. And we've since then added additional capabilities on the far left, vulnerability management and assets inventory and profiling, and on the far right, uh, log intelligence, the ability to look for event-driven uh, data. And finally, underscored at the very bottom here, and really also an underscoring of a key point that Tony was uh, making, that uh, it is information management, and we have to be able to uh, move that, uh, collect the information, move it, translate it, uh, turn it into actionable insights that then uh, you can take action on it. So that's been a, a core focus of ours the last, uh, last 20 years. And so with that uh, word from your local sponsor, uh, kind of back to uh, the program already in progress, uh, and some questions, uh, Tony, for you, and I see some questions starting to come in. So uh, we'll uh, kind of begin with a maybe very uh, basic one, and that is, what are your observations, Tony, on how the CIS controls get implemented in practice? What works and what doesn't tend to work when it is time to implement the CIS controls? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Maurice. Yeah, the, um, you know, everyone that we've talked to, and the, the beauty, again, of CIS is we get to talk to lots of doctors uh, now, and we, we have a way to reach out to them and survey and so forth. So we're really getting a handle uh, that we didn't have two years ago on, on what the major problems are, the successes are, and so forth. Uh, most, most start with some sort of assessment process, which is very common, either hire a consultant to come in or they take a look at it themselves and they kind of run through the whole list. You know, this is the kind of thing that happens in a day or a week or a month. It's not a long, drawn-out process. To, to take a look at every sub-control, look at all of our recommendations, and try to figure out where you are relative to those. And uh, there are various ways to do that. Again, the, the first pass of this, you don't want to overthink it too much. You want to kind of do it quickly. Um, there are uh, tools like spreadsheets and scales, and, uh, maturity things that people have uh, have developed that would help you do that, you know, looking at every sub-control and uh, giving yourself a 1 to 3, 1 to 5, or a red, yellow, green sort of a thing. And if anyone's interested in that, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, and then uh, numerous consultants have their own way of doing that. And that gives you kind of a, a broad sweep across, you know, problem areas and what you ought to focus in on. You also find that uh, we, we can provide you a way to map from that to the frameworks of interest to you, right? Whether it's the NIST cybersecurity framework or ISO or PCI or whatever, just to get a sense for kind of where you sit in the universe of, of people looking over your shoulder. But a lot of this is about you know, getting started. So we have, you might have noticed in uh, version 7 we have uh, put three 
sort of blocks of the controls together, one, the sort of basic and foundational and organizational. And, you know, our focus, our recommendation is always focusing on the on these basic activities that one through six primarily. Uh, think about them and think about the kind of first few steps that you will take. I will say in some of the emerging areas, uh, people are struggling with the very, very basics of just knowing what's in their enterprise, the sort of notion of inventory. And uh, we're, we're going to, We've heard that enough, especially from, I'll say, large medical service delivery systems and the IoT world. We're going to do some new projects over the next few months to help people look at that problem as a separate one. How do I get, how do I get to that point? Uh, the, but the advice I give people is don't, don't, again, don't overthink this one. Uh, I'll say as technologists, one mistake I see made over and over again is that uh, people believe if they don't have a perfect answer, then they don't have an answer at all. And that's just, you know, even... Uh, the act of looking for a small enterprise, even manually uh, inventorying what you have, knowing who's got, you know, making conscious choices about administrative privilege as well as uh, inventory things is a big step up and points you in the right direction. And if you wait for the perfection of complete technology coverage of a worldwide distributed complicated enterprise, you will never get there. So, so I'd say set our sights a little bit more modestly, uh, work with what you have to start with and don't, don't get too carried away with it. But focus in the sort of Top six. Uh, those also are the foundational things that, again, don't don't think of it. You have to do literally every word, but think of it as uh, make an a honest, conscious choice as you go through to prioritize uh, within that. We can also help you connect you uh, with other enterprises that are kind of like yours that are on that same journey, and you know, point you towards that. We're now collecting use cases and sort of uh, adoption stories of folks and how they've done this, and uh, as a as a um, sort of popular science level, we have lots of those now posted to the website, uh, cisecurity.org. Just a follow-up to that, uh, maybe, Tony, is, you know, we um, certainly, it's uh, comforting to, uh, to hear you say don't overthink it, uh, but at the same time, I think a lot of us are uh, kind of paranoid, both by uh, nature, perhaps, and certainly by professional conditioning, and we, we read these, you know, statistics. We hear about how we continue to fail at some of the basics. And so we know that there's probably more there that we should be doing. Um, right. And we also can't know what we don't know. So uh, um, how, how does an organization know that they have implemented the CIS controls well enough? Yeah, that, the the good enough question is, I think, one of the most important ones that uh, both CIS is facing and everyone is facing right now. And so, um, you know, we in the past have provided um, – what we did with version 6, you might recall, Maurice, was that I separated out the what we call the measurement companion from the controls document itself. Because I, I just think the whole business of measurement metrics is a faster changing target than the controls. You know, history shows us that that, that to be true. And we refocused around measurement, and, and, and I used, um, I, t I took a definition from NIST around the difference between measurement, you know, the, the extraction of system data and uh, artifacts from the system uh, that are, uh, in effect, objective measures is different from metrics, right? which you compose, the, the key difference is when you make a value judgment, right, that, that something is good enough or it should be above or below a threshold or whatever, and I want to distinguish the, the, the thinking from one from the other. So uh, we updated that document for version 7 of the controls. Also, a big motivator for version 7 was to clean up and simplify the wording of every part of the CIS controls in preparation for better guidance on measurements and metrics. Uh, so you'll see us come out with something new, uh, I'm sure within the next several months on that topic also, about how to measure things and what system artifacts to associate with the um, uh, with every individual subcontrol and what you would look for to tell you that you've done a successful job, yes or no. This turns out to be, you know, and I'm sure some, many of your audience know this, a, a complicated problem. Uh, we are looking at this from, um, the, the viewpoint of identifying all these, I'll call them uh, measurements, you know, the, the, the state of a registry key, the value of a registry key, the state of a file permission, et cetera, that we can associate with these good practices as defined in the benchmarks and controls. 
We're also looking at, and we're collecting all those, right, looking at the way that those are measured from lots of different tools. We're also looking at the, um, what I would call observables, things you could see from outside an enterprise that would tell you you are successfully or not unsuccessfully implementing specific controls. In fact, a whole industry has popped up in the last few years around that, around these kind of external observables to help generate risk scores uh, for enterprises. And then there's a number of things in the controls that just don't lend themselves very well to measurement at all. And we've tried to minimize those, but where you know um, a lot of things are done the way we know how to uh, validate them, unless it's a really complicated machine process, is to ask a human being to take a look, right? To, to look at data, to talk to the um, operators, to look for the presence of certain processes, for example, and so forth, to make sure that some things are managed. So we're trying to put all that together into a package that will become another product out of CIS that, that folks can use, both to measure this kind of um, progress indicator as well as what is good enough. Uh, finally, on the, on the really on the what is good enough question, uh, some of your listeners may have noticed that we released just recently something called CISRAM, the CIS Risk Assessment Methodology. And this is a big step uh, in evolution for us. I, I mentioned this transition from cybersecurity as really a, a techno geek focused activity into something that we embed into larger decision making about businesses and about society. CISRAM is a big step in that direction. It's an assessment methodology about uh, what's good enough that's based on the CIS controls, but is not a technical assessment methodology. It was really developed as IP by a law firm and a consulting company, and then uh, brought to CIS, and we have generalized it and released it out to the public. So it really looks at this decision of, you know, what is the CIS subcontrol asking me to do? Uh, what are the what problem is it trying to solve? What are the implications of me solving it? And is there an alternative way for me to solve it? Or if I don't do what CIS seems to recommend here, what is my residual, what is the risk associated with my business, for example? In other words, it may be, and this does happen in security, of course, that the uh, cure sometimes seems worse than the disease, right? I could put these great controls in place but I've alienated the entire hunk of my customer base and they'll never come back, right? They'll go to my competitor instead. Well, that might be the right security decision, the right technical decision, but it's not a very good business decision in many cases. And so CIS RAM walks you through an organized way to think about those problems, make and document the decision about it in a way that is amenable and presentable in a court of law. And that's kind of the idea of SysRAM. So we, and we put that out there uh, you know, both to address this problem and because we're really looking for feedback on, on the utility of it. So again, don't think of it as a new technical assessment method, but think of it as a way to, to transition the key technical learnings and lessons and recommendations of the controls into a broader legal-focused decision framework. And you'll, I think you'll see more of that kind of work from us over the next year because I just really believe important that how important this notion is of translation from the technical domain into this broader decision-making domain. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tony. It's, uh, that's very helpful. Uh, one question that uh, often has come up, and certainly in this context, in this discussion, is is based on the observation that you know over the years the controls themselves haven't changed much. That uh, going from version six to seven, for example, was not a uh, profound change in terms of uh, the key controls and recommendations. And yet, meanwhile, within a broader context, uh, certainly in terms of new technology, uh, emerging threats, ever-expanding attack surface, and so forth, you know, there are a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of new things to consider, at least uh, certainly new capabilities on the offensive and defensive side to consider. What, uh, what are your thoughts and observations on some of these uh, new technologies and new uh, contextual factors? And, and this is very broad. It could include, you know, protecting cloud-hosted assets uh, or securing the cloud env uh, environment itself. Uh, if we're looking at software application development, there's uh, certainly the, uh, the rapid adoption of DevOps as a paradigm, a process as much as a technology. And it's certainly the Internet of Things and industrial environments and so forth as we see this ever-expanding attack surface. 
what are your thoughts on you know the applicability of the controls within this rapidly changing, very dynamic environment? And are there things in this new environment that we need to uh, be particularly aware of? Yeah, that's a great, great question, Maurice. I mean, I think and your observation is right on that the sort of foundational nature of the controls hasn't changed dramatically in the last, uh, I think, three versions. And, you know, with the controls, we've, we've always tried to hit what I would call a sweet spot. You know, um, security frameworks or recommendations cover the entire spectrum of possibility, right? from very, very uh, specific, fine-grained, uh, you know, things like you know, go to the whitelisting store and buy the, the best whitelisting program, you know, kind of very uh, discreet, um, granular things. And, and a, a large number of enterprises like that, right, because they know exactly what to do. And even more, don't like that because it really locks you into a particular set of technologies or the way to solve a problem. Then at the other end of the spectrum, you have these sort of what I would call cosmic frameworks, you know, which are uh, go do a go do a risk assessment, go understand the entire problem, uh, go do good things, and then write a paper that said you did good things. And uh, so they they are not very helpful in that they're so open ended and so broad that and so there's everything in the middle. And of course, which we've attempted to uh, build some consistency into understanding of the problem in a way that gives you options and that allows for these. Um, the evolution of technology, all those great examples that you mentioned, right? So several things are moving in, in motion here, or in motion all the time. There's the nature of attacks, which frankly have not changed that much at all in quite a few years. Yeah, the, the specific techniques and so forth, sure, and our understanding has changed, but the nature of sort of over and over again exploiting uh, poor configurations, bad management, human beings, processes, and so forth, has been pretty st steady. Uh, there's another dimension of the business use of technology, that has changed a lot over the last years. Uh, the, the way that we as consumers demand services from businesses or from governments, the way that gets implemented, you gave some examples of the way we build the, the technology to deliver services through DevOps, et cetera. These are all in motion, and we have to account for those in the controls. And then there's the sort of fundamental nature of technology itself. You know, the, the emergence of cloud in the last few years, the, uh, the sort of different types of environments, the emergence of the just overwhelming scale of, um, you know, the uh, Internet of Things, that's in constant motion. And we have to think through all that every time we think about the controls. And so we, we attempt to do that. But the, 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 the good news is that the sort of nature of attacks has been, I'd say, the, of, of all those, the most stable. And so I think that's reflected uh, imperfectly, but it's reflected well in the controls themselves. You can see, though, uh, for example, you know, as we surveyed our user base, the most frequently requested, um, gee, I wish you would produce a companion document for controls on this topic is cloud. And so we have just formed a team. We're putting together volunteers uh, to work that as a separate issue because so many people have moved so much of their IT infrastructure out, out to uh, cloud or through managed service or through some, some mechanism that's not under their direct control and not under their premise. That's especially true for small and medium enterprises. That's just a... You know, essentially, that, that's uh, people have given up on trying to solve this problem at the local level. They're they're moving it implicitly to someone else to deal with the problem. So we really need to take that on. You've seen, you mentioned the CIS benchmarks. We now uh, you can now get our hardened images from the three uh, cloud suppliers. Uh, we're moving more of our ideas and our um, controls, our recommendations, sort of further upstream to follow the technology exactly as you described, because that's where the that's where the data is going. That's where the operations are going, and so we have to be prepared for that. I'd say the um, the IoT thing is problematic because we we cannot, as an industry, solve that you know by patching faster in the way we might think of doing that at the scale of enterprises and desktops. We really need to think more, say more architecturally about that, and so we're going to you'll see us tackle that problem. We have a number of individual projects underway right now under industrial control systems and sort of slices of that problem. But more broadly, I think we have to think of this as a really a foundational architectural issue. So between the uh, levels of abstraction, between the movement of the controls, and it's, think of the content as separate from the plumbing. You know, plumbing is a delivery mechanism, right, whether it's the cloud, whether it's IoT devices. We are right in the middle of that at CIS and really trying to follow, uh, anticipate the, the nature of tax, the nature of business use of technology, and then foundationally the technology itself. 
and taking our ideas, the ideas are really generated by this volunteer community, and coming up with new new ways to deliver that content with these things. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I think we have uh, time for just one more quick question, uh, and this may not even be a quick one, actually, but uh, it is an important one. So how do the CIS controls address advanced persistent threats? Wow, okay, yep, and I hear that all the time. Yeah, that's great stuff, Tony. Uh, that's hygiene, that's the basics, love the basics. But what about those Wiley uh, APTs? And, you know, uh, I, I can tell you with a straight face, I lived with Wiley APTs for at least three and a half decades. And, again, they're professional, they're good at what they do, but they don't do magic. And so you, uh, the, the notions of the controls give you um, – Lots, you know, the, the bad guys, no matter how sophisticated, are all kind of working in the same noise floor. And so you need to do the foundational things anyway because they're eating you alive otherwise. And you, you can't tell, frankly, whether it's uh, teenage joyriders, uh, hardened criminals, or nation states. So you might as well just deal with the problem uh, at scale. That's, that really is foundation of the controls. But uh, don't think of them, and I think this is a, a um, strategic mistake, to think of this sort of mainstream mass market problem as really a distinct problem from advanced persistent threats. There are threats that are more advanced and are more persistent. There's no question. But they're using essentially the same techniques. And what really helps you understand the advanced threats are both their sophistication of their infrastructure and their delivery mechanisms, but, but also their patience and their willingness to, uh, to lie, cheat, and steal, right, to bypass your defenses. And so that's why you make, have to make intelligent choices about defense, not at one place, but at multiple places. And this, this notion of the controls is really about laying a foundation no matter it – do, it does deal really, really well, I believe, with, with the vast majority of this mass market attack. But to understand the advanced threat is really about understanding, um, in, the, in the defense department and government sense, the intentions and capabilities of the attackers. And if you had that, I said this earlier, if you had insight into that, right, you bought the right magic fee, uh, threat feed, you could get insight, the government would share it with you, the law enforcement would share it with you, you have a friend, uh, you know, a, a way to get that insight, always ask yourself, what am I going to do with it? And I take action upon it. Because that information will almost always require you to turn back to your technology, find something, right, whether it's a file with a certain hash of a certain date or a particular port or a particular uh, a mechanism, a registry key, and do something with it. Change it, delete it, block it, move it, whatever. And if you haven't built that action architecture, I'll call it, uh, you will never be able to deal with advanced threats, right? So the good news is the foundation helps you with kind of the mass market problem, but you really need it also for more advanced problems too. So again, please, my, my plea to the audience, don't think of them as distinct problems. Think of them as related problems. And so uh, you are not wasting your time to deal with the mainstream problem. I'm not aware of any magic that's coming that will enable us to just throw our defenses away and count on some magic. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Tony. Thank you for... Uh Laying a good foundation for us in terms of our, uh, our awareness, understanding, and, and uh, productive things to do. Uh, but we're at the top of the hour. We could go on, but we must uh, move on. So, uh, Kate, I'll pass it back to you to wrap us up. Thank you, Maurice. And, yes, we're at the top of the hour, so I'll do a quick closing here. First, I'd love to thank our uh, feature presenter, Tony Sager of the CIS. Tony, thank you for your time. We were thrilled to have you on our event today um, sharing your years of experience and expertise. Thank you also to Maurice Unuma. Thanks, uh, Maurice. Uh, for your time, and thank you for our audience uh, for joining us today. As I mentioned earlier, and I, I emailed a lot of you during this uh, in the, the Q&A chat, we will be sending out a link to the on-demand version of the webcast along with a link to SlideShare for the slide deck. We do hope you'll join us for future webcasts. We want to thank you, and have a great day. <laughs>